All right. Basically, the context of this presentation is it's a philosophical point of view into how we're building an open sharing culture in the Philippines. This is largely because we believe that, or rather, we believe that when it comes to sharing things, and not necessarily just within the open source movement, that would be sharing food, sharing photos, sharing, I don't know, even sharing your own house. You know, Filipino people are actually leaders in that, and I'll tell you why later. So anyway, my presentation is entitled, Sharing Beyond Sharing, Fostering an Open Sharing Culture in the Philippines. And it is a philosophical look into how we are building an open sharing culture. It also looks into the intricacies between Filipino culture and the culture of the open source movement and how these two interact, especially when considering certain tenets of Filipino social psychology and even Filipino culture into forming the sharing culture. And the reason for why I'm looking at this is because my general interest, even though I am a political science major, is largely dealing with culture, well, open source culture and its interactions with our traditional national cultures, which in this case, since I am from the developing world, would be the interaction between the open source movement and culture in the Philippines. And so even though I only have one person watching today, <laughs> I hope the camera doesn't get that, but you know, um, I'm sure that this will hopefully be a very enlightening presentation. So anyway, why is the presentation entitled Sharing Beyond Sharing? And that is because it is in Filipino culture to share. We love to share everything, no matter what you do. You know, when it comes to fiestas, you have people sharing in the fun of the celebrations, particularly in small towns where fiestas are the, are the key celebration of the town in general. So everybody comes out, everybody celebrates. Normally, when you're in a small town, everybody comes out making food, and then you just go from house to house eating each other's food among other things. This is actually a street dancing festival in my home province of Parinduque, just south of Manila. The second one, however, is, of course, the feasting. Um, yes, we love to eat. This is the reason why Instagram is so popular in the Philippines. This is also the reason why, when it comes to enjoying other, when it comes to enjoying, in this case, this is a boodle fight. Eh? So the, when it comes to enjoying food, we'd love to share it with everybody, and so, Tying that back from the fiestas, if you are invited, let's say, to somebody's house to eat, you're expected to eat there. Um, following that would be texting, which I'll explain later, and revolutions, which I'll also explain later. There's actually the 1986 heads of revolution, um, where, in fact, that was one of the first major revolutions wherein sharing was involved when it comes to actually mobilizing people and bringing them out onto the streets, in this case, to overthrow Ferdinand Marcos in 1986. So while it is in our culture to share, and we agree, in general, that you know, sharing is indeed an integral part of our culture, as I'll explain later on, the question now is whether or not this necessarily translates into the open source movement. Does it mean that just because we like sharing text messages and you know, spreading gossip, or opening our homes to foreign strangers like you guys, and you know, being invited to the mayor's house, and the mayor even wanting to, excuse me, to sleep on the floor just so he can accommodate the guest. Does that necessarily mean that we will open the open, uh, welcome the open source movement with open arms? And so that is a very important question which we're going to look at um, in this presentation. So first, let's actually talk about manifesting a sharing culture in real life. And in this particular section of the presentation, in the paper which, accom uh, which accompanies it, this basically talks about how we as a people in the Philippines manifest a sharing culture beyond the open, um, the open source movement. So you should remember that in the open source movement, the reason why we even share in the first place is because, according to Richard Stallman, computer users should be free to modify programs to fit their needs and free to share software because helping other people is the basis of society. Therefore, when it comes to tying this into a philosophical perspective, basically we're being told that, you know, hey, the reason why we are doing what we are love to do here right now at Open Source Bridge is because, it's not just because we're told to, but rather it's because we feel that we have an obligation to share what we need to know with everybody because it's for the greater benefit of everybody. And that greater benefit is, is for, ah, excuse me, and that greater benefit is designed so that everybody in turn benefits from the good that that particular, let's say, let's say piece of software, edit that you make on Wikipedia, so on and so forth, benefits from. 
And so developers, according to parents, contribute to, um, to open source because of the following. Actually, the three major tenets of the open source movement. Number one, to write, the right to make copies of the program and to distribute those copies. The second one is the right to have access to the software source code, the necessary preliminary before you can change it. And the last one is the right to make improvements to the program. Which um, Now, the question here is, if, we are, if it is inherent in the open source movement that we are to share, and that this sharing is an integral part of the culture that we belong to, does this necessarily mean that cultures that inherently have sharing cultures will necessarily open their arms to that? This is where this concept ties in. This is actually a house being moved in the rural Philippines by a bunch of people. In this case, these are probably your neighbors, these are probably your, your extended family. And in this case, is actually a concept called Bayanihan. The concept there is, it's a concept of mutual aid wherein um, you'd given, uh, it's not a give and take relationship rather, but it's more like you give and you give and you give. And at the same time, you don't just take, you also give back through that other person. And it's part of an interconnected web of, um, of social doctrines and social beliefs, which in turn shape the Filipino person to be what he or she is today. And so, according, whoops, and so according to um, Tomas Andres, Bayanihan embodies the following principles, which I think we can all identify with in the open source movement. Community development, devotion to one's labor, and one's work is for a greater common objective, which in this case is us trying to make sure that our work goes beyond ourselves, that our work, excuse me, that our work goes towards developing the community and goes towards developing society at large. And the reason for that is because we feel that in, or rather, in the Bayanihan concept, the idea there is that you as a person do not benefit. It's supposed to be everybody that benefits from, let's say, moving that house. If you were to move that house to a more profitable rice field, then the expectation there is that when you start tilling your rice field and when you start harvesting your rice, it's not just you who benefits, let's say, from the better rice field, but the entire community benefits from it as well. And so, where does this interact with the open source movement? Wherein we're supposed to be told as Filipinos that, you know, there is a benefit to actually sharing our blessings and the open source movement wherein we're being told that it is okay to share what we know. Um, for me, the discourse here is that there is an interaction between these two. And here we can tie in the idea of Jürgen Habermas, who is a German sociologist, where he believes that the exchange of ideas and opinions still facilitates the creation of a public opinion shaped by interpersonal interaction, which occurs both online and offline. So what happens here is that you have an interaction between people who probably have never heard of open source before and people who, you know, are bringing, well, let's say, are bringing open source to some rural town in the Philippines or to, some, to somebody who doesn't know anything about it. And so what happens here is that when they are told of these beliefs that we, ha that we hold dear in the open source movement, they start thinking, this, is this necessarily beneficial for me? At the same time, given the, con given the idea that this is a communal effort, what can I do to make this benefit the community at large? Now granted, excuse me. Now granted, a lot of people may like to look at this from a very selfish point of view into, and this is pretty common in the Philippines as well, looking at it from a what's in it for me standpoint. And I will admit that it readily happens, but I do think that the interaction here exists in such a way wherein if you were to look at it from a macro point of view, these interactions start to shape um, our perceptions, not only of the movement in general, but of who we are as people as well. And so, so if we do embrace the movement, if we were to agree with the tenets and you know, we are going to start becoming developers or becoming open source fanatics, will we be able to make ourselves relevant? This is where the discourse comes in because if we look at it from a macro point of view, and I, do, and I hope I will not offend anybody in this room, even though open source is a very egalitarian global concept, it is still largely derived from wealthy Western countries, let's put it like that. It is inherently a product of the digital divide. And so the question now is how you're going to gap, I mean, how you're going to bridge the digital divide 
between rich and poor, between first world and third world, and how to make this relevant so that everybody benefits from it. Because it, I don't think it would be fair if we are going to just accept it wholesale and believe it and believe in it without actually trying to believe in it ourselves. Um, so if you look at this map, you can notice that most of the countries here that are in dark blue are, and if you were in Brandon Harris's talk yesterday, seven continents exist in the world, but only two are adequately covered. That's North America and Europe, which coincidentally in this map are also the countries, or rather the continents, with the darkest blue shades on this map. This is actually a map showing internet coverage in the world. In the Philippines, only 25% of households have internet access. 25% total, actually, which is still a very far way, a uh, long way off from countries like here in the United States, like much of Western Europe, like Canada, which I'm surprised actually, Canada has a darker shade of blue than the US. Um, and so the question now is whether or not when we participate in the movement, does it mean that, and we want to give something back, does it mean that are we leaving our own mark in the movement or does the movement start to define us? So the question now is whether or not the movement necessarily, um, whether or not we embrace the movement and turn it into something that is inherently Filipino, in quotation marks, or whether the movement shapes who we are as a people and we just accept the beliefs wholesale. It's a very tough question to answer because we don't really know how people will be able to perceive the movement once they start participating in it. I wouldn't know, for example, if your local Python developer is necessarily adopting a Western point of view when he develops Python or when he is developing Python, he turns it into something which is probably closer to his or her belief system. Um, which, of course, leads me to the second portion of this presentation, which I think is the more important portion, which is building an open sharing culture in the Philippines. And for me, the very first time we manifest this open sharing culture is with, well, yeah, building an open sharing culture in the Philippines is a story of adaptation. And that was because we have always tried to use tools to help us um, develop as people, to help us develop as a nation. In this case, the use of technology to help develop the nation, at least socially, began in 2001 with this revolution. Um, this is actually the second EDSA revolution, which unfortunately I was too young to participate in. And I was in the US at the time. What happened here was um, in 1998, former president Joseph Estrada was elected. He was an actor. He was elected um, with, the, with heavy support from the masses. He won 40% of the vote. Um, a number which has only been, <clears throat> excuse me, a number which has only been topped this um, three years ago by the current president, Benigno Aquino III. And what happened was he was implicated in a number of corruption scandals. And in 2001, people went out to the streets after the Senate of the Philippines voted against opening a controversial envelope, which may have, which could either make him or break him. And people started protesting on the streets. Four days later, he resigns. Now, the question here is, what exactly is it in this revolution that made it so spectacular from a technological point of view? If you go back to the 1986 EDSA revolution, excuse me, there. If you go back to the 1986 EDSA revolution, the main mobilizing factor in that revolution was actually radio. The Catholic Church called on everybody on the radio, go out to the streets, demand that Marcos resign. In 2001, the main mobilizing factor, even with the support of the church, even with the support of the military, was actually this phenomenon called text messaging. These are actually three messages um, among a bunch that were sent during the revolution um, leading up to the ouster of Joseph Estrada. Now, of course, one of them is particularly interesting. This is for the record. On January 20, 2001, in the Philippines and the United States, the new presidents will be sworn in, both children of former presidents, and both taking over from womanizers. Now, of course, we don't know yet whether or not Bill Clinton really is a womanizer, right? Right? So, well, that's questionable. But the point is, these messages actually had an impact in people's perceptions of the political discourse. In this case, because they were able to um, ad uh, excuse me, adapt the discourse into something which is 
beyond the traditional realm of politics, they were able to create a space wherein their previously subverted opinions, because of course the media is dominated by traditional media outlets, your powerful politicians, etc., so that their voices could be heard. And what happened was their voices were heard on January 20th, 2001, when former President Estrada resigned and Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, lover, hate her, became president of the Philippines. Um, now, this is actually a manifestation of your smart mobs. Um, with, and, in, and in this case, it's actually the first time that a smart mob was actually used in the Philippines to really mobilize people politically. And so what happens here is you actually see two discourses develop. You have a discourse wherein Excuse me. You have a discourse wherein your traditional voices are heard, but at the same time, you have a discourse wherein voices which were previously unheard in the traditional discourse, which would normally contain your traditional media outlets, your newspapers, your television, your radio, were, were unable to be heard of from here. And so what happens is that in your alternate discourse, the pressure builds up there, and then these voices eventually get heard in the mainstream discourse. In the Philippines, if you were to tie this into a software development standpoint, you have a lot of people in open source, but yet the main, that yet the main developers, or rather, most people who, are, who identify with software in the Philippines still identify with Microsoft, Apple, or Google. Maybe Facebook, even though you know, Facebook technically isn't software. Well, maybe it is. But, your open source developers are part of an alternate discourse wherein they are unable to really listen, or rather they're unable to participate in the mainstream discourse because they don't really have the power to be there. The fact that the discourse in the Philippines with respect to software development, with respect to the software culture, is still dominated by traditional software companies, by proprietary closed source models, means that your open source movement is forced to work double time in order to make sure that their voices are heard here. And so, when it comes to sending text messages, when it comes to mobilizing people to assist in times of social calamity, in this case, this is where I'm from, everyone's a hero. And this was, um, this became viral in 2009 after, whoops, um, this became viral in 2009 after Typhoon Ketsana, or Ondoy in the Philippines, hit and flooded 75% of the capital region. And so what happened was people were mobilized to really help out other people who were affected by the floods. You saw people rescuing other people who were swept away by the floods. You saw people giving out food, and uh, um, giving out shelter, giving out other necess necessary items so that people can survive the day to day. Because people really lost a lot in 2009. And so, when it comes to this, we have to tie um, that idea of sharing what we know, or rather sharing what we have, into the greater idea of whether or not this concept of sharing really translates into open source. In this case, open, so open sharing in the Philippines does not only stem from bayanihan, wherein you feel that you have, that you're part of a community, therefore whatever I do, you have to be, um, everyone should benefit from it, but also from a very peculiar concept in Filipino social psychology, which is called kapwa, which is untranslatable in Filipino, um, from Filipino to English. But it, all, it basically means, um, it means the other in your standard dictionary definition, but it also implies going beyond yourself. And so it is a union, according to a Filipino sociologist whose name still escapes me for some reason, it is a union of the self and the other. And so in this case, normally when you, are the, when you are doing something that you love, the main motivation is the profit motive. You are doing something because you want the money for it, or rather it makes you feel good. But when it comes to open source, it's not enough that it makes you feel good, but rather it's also that it makes others feel good as well. The concept exists in Filipino social psychology because when it comes to the concept of kapwa, you cannot necessarily other other people. It's pretty difficult to other other people unless you want to cut all social ties with them, which is the worst thing that you could do. Um, and so, 
I'm sorry for the photo, okay? This is, I actually pulled this off randomly out of Flickr. But the idea behind it is basically everybody is out to look out for one another. Everybody is out to, trying to, ah, okay. Everybody is out to make sure that I am relevant to you. Or I also leave my mark to, um, to make myself significant to you. Um, so, you're develop, um, so you're a developer and you're developing a product. You're leaving your own mark. And at the same time, you're influencing other people who may be developing the product as well. So it's not enough to say that, you know, I'm taking the credit for everything. It's not, that's not true, of course. Um, it's really a manifestation of the shared effort of contributing to that final product wherein it's not just you who, takes in, who partakes in the triumph of the product, but everybody else does as well. And so the thing with Kapwa compared to other systems of social interaction is that it has an inherent leveling effect. Everybody supposedly holds hands and sings kumbaya. Now, of course, we know that that doesn't really happen in real life. And there will be cases wherein people will really want to get your head for something or whatnot. But, in, but if you were to look at it from a philosophical point of view, the interaction between the open source movement where everybody is an equal, everybody is not superior to one another, and the Filipino concept wherein I'm already, I am transcending myself to include you in my relationships. We are looking at each other as equals, and even though, let's say, I am your boss, I'm your superior, you're my junior, when we interact, we still believe as if we are equal, even if the power distribution, or rather, um, the power structure between the two of us is disparate. And, um, yeah, is disparate. And so, this union of being myself and of being with the other, or rather, it's not even being with the other, but it's like communing with the other, allows us to look into the dynamics of open source from an inherently Filipino point of view, which in this case would be we are able to look at the way Filipino society is structured and look at whether or not open source will really take off there. Because societally or socially, we have the structures to let open source bloom in the Philippines. We have social, um, social structures which mesh in perfectly with the beliefs and um, with the beliefs and the culture of open source. And so these small exchanges between people, these interactions between you know what seems to be a foreign culture and local culture, eventually grow to become bigger exchanges because the point of open source is that it becomes inclusive of everybody. You want to be inclusive of everybody because it wouldn't be fair if let's say um, I were to develop, um, we were to make something and then let's say only Americans can benefit from it or only Chinese people can benefit from it. So these small exchanges eventually become big exchanges over time. The question now is whether or not open source in the Philippines becomes something that is more Filipino at the end, whether we leave our mark as Filipino people in the end, or whether open source leaves its mark of Filipino culture, but it still remains the monolithic, supposedly Western ideal of open source as it is. My, um, my contention here is that it does leave its mark. Filipino people who participate in the open source movement do leave their marks in the movement. But at the same time, a lot of these interactions are largely limited to a national level and they haven't really materialized internationally. Sure, you know, you have us um, who are able to travel abroad and go to conferences and be able to participate and develop our skills. But most developers in the Philippines have probably never met other developers um, or other open source advocates from abroad. And so these interactions, I believe, are something that we can strengthen in the long run. So, see, I told you this presentation will be short. Um, so the, but there's still one overarching question left that has to be answered in this um, conception of things, and that is whether or not it is enough. Is it enough that we're simply 
encouraging people to contribute to open source. We're telling them, that, you know, hey, this is actually beneficial for us as a people. We believe in the tenets or we believe in the open culture. Therefore, let's go into it. Is it enough to necessarily just jump in? Or should you still encourage them to jump in anyway? So when you ground the movement on existing social realities, there is a saying in the Philippines, ang ano man ang tibay ng piling nga baka ay wala rin lakas kapag nag-iisa. So you know, whatever the strength of a chosen piece of hemp, it will not be strong if it is alone. Um, the saying basically is, you cannot just do things alone. You will also need other people to help you because it is not enough that you're simply doing it alone. And so for me, and it is, it is simply not enough that you know, we're bringing lessons back home we're telling people how to do this, we're telling people how to do that. It really needs a lot of encouragement for people to even get to things, to start things which are completely foreign to them. And so we are getting there in building an open sharing culture. We're just not there yet. And so it really takes a lot of time before we can really get people to actually contribute to the movement. And I think that it would be beneficial if, you know, well, I cannot really say let's all hold hands and help out, you know, back home. But I do think that it is important. Now, when it comes to fostering an open sharing culture, it is not enough simply for Filipinos to manifest it. Because otherwise, without the proper guidance, and I will admit this heartily, we will not be able to do it the way that it ought to be, which in this case would be, if we're going to encourage people to give to open source, we have to make sure that people actually get there. If we're going to foster a culture wherein people can freely share information and that manifests itself onto Wikipedia, for example, or if we're going to be a developer that develops programs, let's say, in your spare time as a hobby, and then, let's say, we'll join Mozilla or, um, or Python or whatnot, these people have to know that they're actually able to do these things, that there is a greater community beyond what they perceive to be the communities that they think they are. Because it's not enough that the community is simply the people in your neighborhood or the people in the city where you live in. There is a greater world out there. And there needs to be more interactions between the greater world and the world of the, Filipinos, of, um, of the Filipino open culture movement so that these, um, these things will be fostered even more. And so, of course, for the greater benefit of everybody. So that ends my presentation. So thank you. Maraming salamat po. And I'd like to thank the Wikimedia Foundation for actually sponsoring my travel coming here to Open Source Bridge 2013. This is my first presentation, and I thank you all for actually listening to me speak. Thank you very much. I think we should turn off the camera now, right? Or, no? All right. Uh, do you have any questions? Even though I know that this is only the two of us and... Yeah. The largest barrier there would actually be access. 25 per, as I mentioned earlier, 25% of Filipinos have internet access. The remaining 75% don't have. And out of that 25%, you have to look at the internet habits of most people. Most, of your, uh, most Filipinos who use the internet will do one of three things. Facebook, no, four things. Facebook, of course, it's number one. Twitter, YouTube, or gaming. Social gaming, hardcore gaming, MMORPGs, and the like. So you have to convince people not just to bring more access to people who don't have access, but also from those who have access that there's more to the internet, there's more, to, um, there's more life out there than simply Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and gaming. I mean, for me, I'm perfectly happy that I use Facebook, but I think that there is a greater world out there wherein their skills and what they know are of better use. The question there is, do people really know or do people really think that they can contribute to these things? There's this perception in the Philippines, and I have no idea why, that Wikipedia editors are paid. I'm not paid a single cent, you know? Um, and so there's really a perception problem when it comes to how open source is perceived. I mean, it's not simply enough that you're telling them, join this. You really have to convince them as to why, how it's beneficial for you, how it's beneficial for others. Oh, OK, 
there we go. Um, it's beneficial for you, beneficial for others, and how these intersections are really for not just the benefit of other people, but also for yourself as well. Yes, Athena. The statistic, the statistic does not include mobile. I think I think it's home internet access. I do know that there is we're actually nearing 100% mobile penetration. Yeah. I mean, it could help. I mean, it could help. It's just that, um, like for me. I use an Android phone. I can't program the darn thing, I, I but that. yeah. I was just kind of wondering if that was part of the disparity of, oh, I don't know, the Philippines is online. And yet also, no one I know in the Philippines uses Android. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
his, um, if I remember correctly, uh, he said that the reason why the communities are not as big as you would like them to be is because of this idea, and I'm not even sure if it's a valid idea, where, um, crap, because it's not just the profit motive, it's the, hmm, I lost my trail of thought there. Um, but I think the idea behind it is that you will really not want to do it unless there is a reason for you to do it. And so in order for you to be able to really get that culture started, you will really have to do a lot of groundwork just so you get yourselves known out there. People know Wikipedia. People know Mozilla. People know, I don't know, people probably know the other, um, other open source projects that we are here with. And unfortunately, I'm not versed with all of them, and I will readily admit that. But people think that you know, they are just users. They don't know that they can actually give something back to that. And so, yeah, it is part of the problem. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, God, I wish I could work from home. I work for an open source media platform. And in the end, I'm the only Latino in working in that company. Anyway, so my thing is, I've been kind of looking around for local communities to meet up with, to join, and just talk about stuff and contribute. But when I look up online, I know some of them, when we did this in 2010, we joined y for it the Philippine Youth Congress in Information Technology. Mozilla was there. I think Python was there. I'm not sure. I know Drupal has a pretty big group in Southeast Asia. A friend of mine in Singapore, you know, I see his posts all the time, and I feel envious because I have no idea how Drupal works. And I'm still trying to learn how Drupal works. Um, I know a lot of them have groups on Facebook. We have a group on Facebook, Mozilla has a group on Facebook, Drupal has a group on Facebook. Uh, MediaWiki, which um, has a group on Facebook, and that group is actually led, um, that group was actually led by, what, um, by our former vice president at Wikimedia Philippines. So I think there's still the sense of community. It's just that, you know, it's just the community. I think that people don't really make an effort to jump in. And that's what we need to do. We need to make sure that people do jump in. The question now is, are the incentives great enough for them to really jump in? So again, thanks, guys. If you have any more questions, just ask me.